tuition. For example, if there is a crisis and all of a sudden they are unable to make a tuition payment or support themselves here, in those situations, USCS would allowed, allow employment authorization. And then at that time, you would, of course, have to report. Um, it's just like, I mean, you hear in like the media or like you'll see in the movies, like the way they get the mobsters is through the IRS. Because again, even if you make the money illegally, it's still taxable. So <laughs> just the IRS will come after you no matter what. Okay. So I put a little information here about grants and scholarships. Um, and I know that there's, you know, uh, different, I, I'm not as familiar with the, you know, the OPT and the CPT standards, like what um, you qualify for typically. Um, but there, if you do receive a grant or a scholarship, there's slightly different rules on how the IRS counts that income. Um, so grants for travel study are there similar purposes. Um, and these would be grants that would be issued um, in the United States. Um, they're taxable expenditures unless these conditions are met. Um, they have to be an objective, non-discriminatory grant. Um, it has to be a scholarship or a fellowship, um, or it's a prize award that's excludable from gross income under a certain IRS code, um, or the grant's purpose is to achieve a specific objective uh, produce, report, or similar product to enhance literary artistics. It's kind of a catch-all here. Uh, musical, scientific, teaching, or similar capacity, skill, or talent of the grantee. Um, so I've got a link again there for further information if you want to, if you, you know, receiving grants or you're eligible for a grant and you'd like to know how that would apply to you. Um, and then the scholarship and fellowship information. So uh, grants is a scholarship or fellowship um, if it's used at an educational institution that normally maintains a regular faculty and curriculum, normally has a regular organized body of students in attendance at the place where the activities are carried on. Uh, for these purposes, grant recipients do not have to be limited to degree candidates, um, nor must they be limited to tuition fees and course required books, supplies, and equipment. So they can use grant funds for room, board, travel, research, clerical help, or equipment um, that's incidental to the purposes of their grant. Um, and then the taxable portion of this is that portion which is not excludable from gross income as a qualified scholarship. So scholarships um, and fellowships are nice because they do allow some money that is can be put towards room and board and, and, and whatnot. Again, there's a link there on there. Um, so, Filing taxes, <laughs> the TurboTax issue. So TurboTax does not support non-resident tax forms. If you've already filed a Form 1040 on accident with TurboTax, then there's gonna be corrective action you have to take. So you'll have to amend the return, um, and that is done through filing a Form 1040X, and you attach your proper return with it. Um, and that's the Form 1040NR. Um, if you did file through TurboTax, based on what options you selected, TurboTax may be able to help you with this, but they don't support the NR, so their guidance on how they're going to help you is a little unclear to me, <laughs> um, but they may help at least provide you the forms or have you talk to someone to walk you through it. Um, and they also have an affiliated partner called Sprint Tax that does do 1040 NR filing. So that seems to be like the most popular one, um, but I want to put it out there that software companies change so much about their software year to year. So what I'm saying right now may not apply next year. Who knows, with all the blowback that TurboTax has been getting, they might start including the NR. We don't know yet. Um, so there's a good discussion about, um, I put a link there to the TurboTax site where they have a dis uh, discussion going about the TurboTax issue. Um, and you can, the first thing you wanna do when you're selecting um, a tax software is to make sure that it can do the 1040NR, which we'll kind of talk about here. So do you really need an attorney? No, you don't really need an attorney to file your taxes. Um, honestly, we'll probably pay, charge you a little more. <laughs> um, and it's not really going to make a huge difference if you've got a really basic return. Now say, you know, you've got all these different assets and you've got things going on um, multiple countries and you've you know, got a lot of property ownership and whatnot and there's some sort of concern and this is like further down in um, like an advanced visa stage, then yeah, sure, maybe. Um, but most tax preparers can assist on I'd say like 99% of tax returns. 
Um, so unless you've got some sort of really quirky, interesting thing, uh, really tax attorneys come in when you've made a mistake. Um, or you've left something out, an act of omission, um, or um, you get audited and then you need to uh, you know, deal with the audit team, um, or you wanna do tax planning. So you're like, this is my scenario, you know, I own X, Y, and Z, I have this business, I wanna do this. You know, what's the best way to set everything up um, business organization-wise? That's kind of where the tax attorney really comes in. Um, and so if you feel comfortable, again, you can look for a tax preparation software that is capable of doing the form that you need, which is the 1040 NR in most cases here. Um, and you can also check out the local, uh, the local VITA program. Um, so it's something I volunteered for. It's a volunteer service that the IRS actually puts out. So everybody there is trained with the IRS procedures and rule books, um, and they offer low income tax prep. So when I did it, um, I, I think I did some students, I did some people with low income housing, you know, it was like, it's like a wide variety, um, and VITA operates all over the state. So the IRS has a whole listing of VITA operators on their site as well. Um, but just like, again, make sure you are listing all of your income and you're using the proper form and that will save you the most hassle out of everything. Um, I'd just like to add one thing oh, yeah. here. Um, you probably want to check out the clinic at the law school. They might have uh, something to suggest uh, if you are at WMU and of course, because um, a lot of individuals, uh, they get help for white through a uh, clinic as well. Okay. So the next important piece that was uh, part of the survey here is the economic impact payments. Now, taxpayers do not qualify for the economic impact payment if they meet any of these following guidelines, which is there's some income guidelines here, if you're claimed as a dependent, if you don't have a valid social security number, and then the important ones, you're a non-resident alien or you filed a 1040 NR. Um, so if you um, do not meet those requirements, you cannot receive the economic impact payment. Now, the IRS rolled this all out so quickly and everything was done, you know, just trying to get people money due to the pandemic that they did make some errors when they did this. And I know that some people had mentioned that they had received um, they had received this because maybe they filed the wrong tax form or maybe there was just an error. I have heard that the IRS has, has done it just in plain error on their part. Um, but what that means is you need to return the payment. <laughs> so this is critical. A person who is not eligible um, is, must return the payment immediately. So the IRS does not list a due date here, but I would say the sooner the better. If they have to come hunt you down for the money later, I don't know if that could possibly have any other ramifications on your immigration status um, or future visa processing. Um, so I just wouldn't risk it. I would just go ahead and return it as soon as possible. Um, so there's some instructions here that I've included as well on how you should return the payment. So if you received a paper check, you didn't cash it, you can just send that baby back. <laughs> so uh, you write void on it, uh, where you would sign on the back, you mail it back to the IRS, I've got an address on the next page here, um, and then just they literally include a little note, like was not eligible, um, you know, generally file a 1040 NR, just some sort of indication as to why you're returning it. They'll basically, they just want the money back, they want that check back. So if you've already cashed the check, it's okay. You still have options to return it or you had a direct deposit, there's still an option. So you can submit a personal check money order um, to the appropriate IRS location. Um, and you're gonna write on the check or money order that it's payable to US Treasury and write 2020 EIP and your identification number, which is either your social security number or individual taxpayer identification number on the recipient of the recipient of the check. Include a brief explanation again of why you're doing it. So just a short, you know, was ineligible, should have filed a 1040 NR, or did file a 1040 NR, received an error, and they will take it back like that. Um, so I included, if you live in Michigan or you file your taxes and you put your Michigan address here, this is the address that you should send it to. Um, but I included a link here that if you do not live in Michigan or you 
um, maybe you're studying in a different state, um, there's, it's all location based. So depending on your state is which IRS service center that you send it to. Um, so there's a link here uh, where you can look up your address and the different service center addresses. Okay, now we're gonna talk a little bit, another hot topic here was Michigan unemployment insurance. Um, so as you can see from this lovely chart that's directly from the state of Michigan, um, benefits payable, you can just go right down that line, no, no, no. Uh, so uh, in general, and, and Ruby may have some comments to add to this, but in general, the uh, Michigan Unemployment Insurance Agency has exceptions that don't allow F1 visa holders to receive benefits. Um, so that's just a... Yep, and that is based on the recent practice advice we have received. Yeah, so Ruby has been all over that. Um, <laughs> and it gives you good reasons here, the purpose, the work authorization. Um, so you're not really paying into the system, which is why they don't allow you to collect from the system is sort of the big overarching theme, but basically not allowed. And another reason for this is because F1s only receive like OPT ah. and CPT unless there is, you know, like that hardship issue that I discussed earlier. So those are considered to be a part of the academic program. So um, the employers uh, that uh, recruit you at, as from OPT and CPT is given they don't pay unemployment insurance. So for those reasons, uh, Michigan has excluded F1s to be receiving the benefits. For I, the there we go, previous, sorry. Like I forgot my shortcut key for previous. Sorry about that, got a little click happy. Okay. So CARES Act unemployment benefits. So Ruby and I have had a lot of discussion on this and we've done a lot of research and overall we can't find anything that authorizes it explicitly. So my interpretation is that it's likely not eligible. So in order to qualify for a lot of the CARES Act, it says it seems to be reliant on if you're eligible at the state level, which Michigan does not allow. Um, I did try to put it out to some other tax attorneys as well, if they've found any sort of guidance on this, um, and nobody else seems to have solid guidance um, besides thinking that it's likely ineligible. Um, Ruby, you can talk a little bit more on the um, immigration side here. Um, yep, so it goes to the same fact I just discussed. The reason they're stating or the practice advisories issued, they're stating that the reason they're not eligible because once uh, you become unemployed uh, or if you come off of your OPT or CPTs, you're essentially unemployed now at that point. So you would have to depart the country. So your grace period is 60 days if you are finishing your OPT and then 90 days um, given that you have not accumulated your 90 day unemployment uh, period. So for those reasons, uh, they are suggesting that F1s are ineligible uh, to receive um, the unemployment benefits. Yeah. Michigan for sure. And I would think that's the same under CARES Act, like, like Jenny said, there is no clear um, uh, writing out there that tells us, you know, it's just based on a lot of information we've been gathering and researching. So. Yeah, yeah, and I, I mean, honestly, I think Congress is going to have to do a little bit more work to clarify some of this, and you may see some things and some more guidance come through, but as of right now, it's, nobody really knows. This is just such an unprecedented time <laughs> that if I would, I would err in the caution of not accepting it, and if you have received it, to possibly not spend it and to attempt to send it back. That would be my recommendation. I'm probably a bit more, um, not in real life, but conservative on this. Uh, <laughs> I would say, <laughs> yeah. I would say in this situation, it may be helpful to be a little conservative and not use it because it could be deemed as something that's you know uh, prohibited at a later point, but it's not very explicit at the moment. Um, so I know that's not a good answer that everyone wants to hear is the, I don't know, it depends. Like we're, you know, we're lawyers, we're infamous for saying that, but in this situation, we really don't know and it really depends. So um, we're just kind of in uncharted water here. So 
Um, I would err on the side of caution. Um, and, you know, there's always, I, I believe there's the ability to go back and probably get it if they do declare it at a later point there may be an option to go back and, and get it. I'm not sure. Again, it's all unchartered. Um, but that's a very long-winded way of saying that we don't know exactly if you under, if that, that makes sense. <laughs> and if we do uh, receive any information on that, uh, we will get back to you guys, of course, you know, and let you guys know, hey, this is what we have heard. But if it's something, um, it's still the same, like we just discussed today, then yeah, then that's the same as is. Yeah. Okay. So again, this is a general statement. Uh, you know, the IRS, everything that happens here with the legal system, with the taxing system, it's all all has an impact on immigration status. Um, so if you're not filing your taxes and you should be filing your taxes, if you're filing the wrong forms and you don't take corrective action to fix it within a reasonable amount of time, um, if you're not returning your money in a reasonable amount of time, things like that, um, it's, it could all be part of the good moral character test. And I know Ruby can speak more about this. Um, but I would say that the, I mean, the IRS knows that this is a problem and that this is an issue. So I would be highly skeptical to think that they would hold it against you um you know too harshly unless you don't take any corrective action to fix it once more corrective action is available um so that's my interpretation again just an interpretation but um you ruby you can probably speak a little bit more to the um to that issue so definitely, uh, you guys do not, as students, as on F1s, you definitely would want to be very careful on um, getting into trouble with, especially the uh, feds. So, and this IRS would go back, you know, to the federal law. So I would strongly suggest at any time, if you are, you know, um, uncomfortable or think that there is a question as to uh, a certain situation, definitely just take, uh, precaution and be conservative about it and um, just discuss with uh, an attorney or you know if it's tax related call Jenny of course but yeah uh, be super conservative about, <laughs> about this when you were a student until even when you become a permanent residence uh, you know even then it, it's very critical that you take uh, a lot of cautions uh, dealing especially dealing with IRS you don't want to be a part of um, IRS fraud or anything uh, similar. Yeah, and same on that note, just to kind of heart back on the unemployment insurance too, people who are applying for unemployment insurance and should not be eligible to receive it, if they answer the application in a way which seems untruthful, um, unemployment insurance agency can issue um, a charge of fraud for unemployment insurance fraud as well. So I just want to put that out there as a, as a general, you know, general warning, um, it's easy to make a mistake on it. So, you know, we've all filled forms out incorrectly, but if you've made a mistake and then you know it's a mistake and then you don't fix it, and then say you continue to receive money after, pay, you know, pay after pay, then it, once this all kind of comes to a head, um, they're probably gonna be going back and doing some investigations um, to try to recoup some of their funds. Um, so I've heard even, you know, there's people all over the place are, kind of filling these applications out willy-nilly and it's just there is a there's a little serious nature to it if you do it incorrectly and you benefit from it so i just want to put that out as a general caution all right question time and i'm going to go ahead and put our contact information up here while we're doing questions so okay so yeah uh before we move on to take some questions from students so we, we are joined in by Akshay Ji and Akshay Ji from Bharatiyam and Hema Ji from Michigan Indian Community Services. They both have really done a great job in supporting students. So I would like to request Akshay Ji if he can share a few, uh, few thoughts about uh, Bharatiyam and its support to international students. Thank you, uh, Minkat, for the for giving me the opportunity to share this information here. And uh, <clears throat> thank you everyone uh, else for joining this call. Um, as Bharatiyam, um, as part of Bharatiyam, we are uh, doing uh, several other things for students uh, similar to these webinars, but other uh, 
uh, for helping students during this situation of COVID-19. One of the, our initiative is uh, setting up a 15 hours helpline, which is uh, available from 8 a.m. Uh, ET to 11 a.m. ET every day, uh, seven days of the week. And through this helpline, so far we have helped uh, 500 plus people with uh, delivering uh, essentials needed or accommodation, providing them accommodation, providing them personalized counseling help for their specific case. And we are also uh, currently supporting around 20 students on a long-term daily basis. Um, we are also, uh, we have uh, conducted several other webinars on issues um, pertaining to immigration counseling and uh, career related issues. Uh, and the same way we are helping other universities to do things at their local level. Um, and uh, yes, Bharatiya Max has a, a student support network providing support to students for um, and student organizations to uh, function through their uh, to their activities to do their activities at their places. So yeah, thank you. Uh, I'll share the helpline details and uh, um, Bharatiya's URL with uh, Venkatji, and he can share with everyone. Yes, yes. Thank you, Akshay ji, and also I have been uh, associated with them from last few months. They are doing great, and also thank you for. Uh, uh, uploading this entire webinar on your YouTube channel, and uh, we have Hema Ji. Uh, Ruby, I, I think you can like better introduce uh, Hema Ji than I do. Uh, we all been working working together with MSES, and of course, um, she has taken more lead in a lot more different other groups in MSES uh, than just solely on international. Care. So, yeah. Uh, Hemaji, would you like to say a few words? Uh, Hemaji, I think I'm not seeing Hemaji. I think she just left again. That's fine. Yeah, it's time to take some questions. Yeah. Okay, good. Bring it on, guys. <laughs> Hello. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, Jennifer and Ruby, for such a detailed session. Uh, so I have a question. So uh, this is uh, regarding the economic impact payment. So yeah. Jennifer described about uh, uh, two things. I couldn't uh, follow. I'm sorry. So one of the thing you said is we should uh, send a check to IRS. And yes. also Jennifer said that we should uh, file the tax again. Uh, and also, also we should fill up the form uh, 1040 NR. So just sending the check back again will do it or we have to you know uh, file the tax again okay yeah so there's um it's kind of two different issues there so if you filed anything but a 1040 nr for any of the tax years you've been present here then you will need to amend that and file which is the 1040 x and attach a 1040 nr which is so the 1040 x is basically hey i'm amending my return and the 1040 nr is hey here's the re the correct return that should have been filed so that needs to happen regardless if you receive the economic impact payment or not if you file the wrong form that needs to happen um if you received the check then that's also a separate step that needs to happen so if you receive the check and you shouldn't have then you should let them know, I received this in error. It was either due to you know, filing the wrong return form, which I'm correcting, or um, it was just sent to me in error, and I am returning this, these funds. And so the, they're kind of, they're related, but they're two separate issues. So make sure that you handle both of them separately. Okay, so uh, just one more follow-up question for yeah. this. So uh, will it be okay if I send the check back again, stating my reason? And the next time I'm filing a tax, I should file a 1040 NR or that um, You should always file the 1040 NR going forward. But if you did not file the 1040 NR, you still do need to accept it. You need to fix that and amend it. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Okay, no problem. Mm -hmm. Hello. You're you're on mute, my good. Yes, if you have, if someone has any other questions, please unmute yourself and then you can ask. Yeah, I have a question. Hello. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I wanted to ask, like, instead of 1040 NR, can we file a 1040 NR EZ? As long as it's a variation of the 1040 NR, that's fine. 
All right, thank you. No problem. Uh, so my question was also similar to that. Uh, when I first filed my tax in 2017, that was my first year being in US, uh, uh, I filed it with Sprintex and I filed it every time with Sprintex. And the first time they prepared the documents were NR easy. And okay. starting from next year, they were always creating 1040 NR. And then after helping several people file their taxes, I realized that if you are filing it for the first time, they are doing NR easy. And then starting second time or later on, they are doing just 1040 NR. And does that change anything? Um, that shouldn't be an issue. Um, they're both, the NR basically is just standing, you know, stating that it's a non-resident. So you should be in compliance as long as you're filing a, an NR form, type form. Okay. And I have one more question. So I received several 1042S, 1042S forms, a um, few for some scholarships or similar funds that I would have won in university, but I also receive it from PNC Bank. And uh, so I did not receive it in my first year, but starting second year, I started receiving it. And every time I receive, I receive it late. So for the first time when I received it late, they, I went to bank and I said that the deadline for filing tax was 15th and now you're, you, they had already posted it on 13th of April. So there was no way I could have received it before 15th. And they said that uh, the amount is less than $10 and so you are not expected to include it in your tax. And so it's not a problem. And I just wanted to listen to your clarification on that. So how much was it for? Uh, how do you figure that out? I don't know that. Okay. Um, I can, put, I can um, update a slide on here with um, sort of the income thresholds that uh, would be helpful for you. Um, but in general, so if you know, this is, the, I guess, a good piece of advice for you is if you know they're always filing late, you can file an extension. So you don't have to file your taxes until the fall. So you can, it's a quick one page form that you can submit to the IRS that says like, I will be filing my taxes, but I'm not going to file them until later in the year. Um, and depending on the type, it, it should be typically by uh, September 15th, then you have to file them. So in your situation, I would recommend probably doing that next year, just so you feel safe, you know, um, and if, you did kind of reach the threshold of income that you would then be, you know, qualified for tax. You may want to go back and amend those returns, but it sounds like they're saying it with it was under ten dollars of taxes. I wouldn't be concerned about that particularly. Um, but you can email me if you want, and I'll just send you some clarification, and I can add a little slide in here to be shared with everyone, just because. I don't want to list the thresholds off the top of my head and be wrong, <laughs> or, and I want to make sure I give you the right information. So um, I can I can add some info on that here for you. Okay, thank you very much. No problem. Uh, hi, Jenny. Hello. Uh, similar question to the 1042S. Uh, actually, even I also won an award of $100, and after filing my taxes, uh, I got this somewhere in the month of March, second week or something like that. And uh, I won an award of $100, but it says the gross income is $371. I don't know how is it even relevant or where exactly it went wrong. So did they pay an amount? Okay, um, I just want to go back on one issue too. So if you didn't receive the funds until your, your tax return, um, so say your tax return, and I, I'm sorry, I should have clarified this with the last question too. Your tax return for the year 2020 is due April 15th, 2021. So if you receive it in April, like say I just received something April of this year, it's not required to be reported until my taxes next year. So just to okay. put that out there. Um, and then you're saying that the, the amounts are different? Yep. They, they either withheld tax for you or they paid an amount directly to your school, is my guess. Um, do either of those seem likely? Without seeing so, it exactly, I'm not sure, to be honest. So basically, uh, the award was uh, used as my tuition fees itself. It was used as a deductible in my tuition fee. So they did use that $100 over there, but I don't know why I still got this one in my mail. 
I don't know that I can answer that question. <laughs> um, I, I think you might want to talk to um, your uh, your school's like financial aid office. Um, they are probably the ones okay. that will be able to answer answer what that money was used for or what it is and be helpful there. And usually okay. you can um, check it on your portal. Uh, there is there should be a statement or there is usually like a line item list that you can check it on. So mm -hmm. check there just in case. If it's not there, then you can always speak with your financial counselor. Yeah, okay. I was also willing to add the same thing because I received several scholarships and funds from university during the year. And you can find it on your WMU portal under payment and information. It will tell you every like total amount that you received. And the tax form that you received, as you stated, is for 371 instead of 100. So that is where you will be able to see what all different money that you received and it will clarify your doubt about this. Yeah, the school has to send you a tax form at the end of the year that shows you all the activity. Um, so it all depends. You, you just talk to your financial aid office about where that money was used and what it was used for. Okay, sure. Thank you. Yep. Uh, I also had a question. So back in fall, I won a competition in WMU for $500, but I didn't receive a tax form to fill like 1042S. Okay, um, when did you get the money? Like, I think around October, September, around that time. So they transferred it to my student account and then they transferred it to my bank through a refund. Okay, and the school didn't send you any documents at the end of the year? No. I would go and um, double check with your financial aid office if they were, if they needed to send you that. And then if they did, then you might, you know, depending on um, the amounts and whatnot, you would maybe need to amend. But um, I would definitely, your financial aid office is really who should be sending you all these forms. So if you're missing information or there's something wrong with your forms, then you need to start with them first and to make sure the information is accurate. All right, all right, thank you. I know, I'm sorry. It's no fun dealing with financial aid. <laughs> no one wants it. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I had a question actually. Uh, yeah. So for people <clears throat> uh, who have got, for students who have got admit in fall 2020, so they have not yet, their visas are not yet approved because the consulates, the US consulates in India are closed. So, but they are advised to start their education like, through distance education, taking up online courses. So is it, is it like, uh, permissible to do this? Is it like okay to do this because what if their visa will not get approved later or something? So is there any some regulation or something by the United States government related to this? So to clarify your question, uh, students who uh, are who have F1s approved, um, they're supposed to start in fall. They are still in India because of the flights issue. They cannot come in. Right? No, it is it is that they have got admits, they have received their I-20s, but they have not yet got their visas because the consulates are closed. So their visas are not approved. So they're going to have to wait. Yeah, gonna... So, but, but like they are advised to start enrolling the courses and start distance education without having visas. But so, what visas are not approved and they're, you know, beginning the education, paying the fees and all that. So, I mean, I would advise to just wait. Okay. Yeah, this will be helpful for those people who are coming. I just want to ask, yeah. wait for the visa until you're approved, and if it's approved, then you know you are continuing your education and you're you'll be finishing your education potentially. Well, so I would suggest wait. Yeah, what if the visa is not approved, right? There's yeah. so, so much that's just coming through almost every day, immigration wise, right? So you want to be extra careful at this point. Right yes. Now. Hi, uh, I have one more question. If an international student uh, have been uh, been studying in US more than five years, they need to file for 1040 or 1040 NR, which one? It's still dependent on your visa status and the tests. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I don't believe that, you know, it being longer than five years, I guess, Ruby, this is where I, I don't understand. I don't know the different steps in the visa process. So at five years, is it still an F1 visa? Yeah, F1 visa. Okay, then I would say you're still doing the, the, the NR. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, hi, I have one more question and it's like kind of similar question. 
so so i applied for this unemployment benefit michigan unemployment benefit and i got it for like 3 weeks and like even my friends got it for 3 week 3 to 4 weeks so like what should we do now i mean like we are so confused that like what we need to do further like how we can send the money back yes and i know um to be perfectly honest the it's impossible to get through to the unemployment insurance agency right now um what you can do is um you can create um a portal account i believe with them i think everyone probably has i'm not sure if you have to have one at this one point or not but create a portal account and i would submit a message to them that you mm-hmm. believe that this was an error and asking them for um the address or how you um how you can send the funds back um, okay. so and then also to stop reporting um you know searching for work or whatever it is and to stop your um to request to stop the payment so you should be able in the portal you just don't certify and you won't receive any more payments so um just okay. don't certify and then send a message through the portal asking for direction on how you return the funds you received okay and okay. i would keep track of that like do a print screen for your records um like i said they're really behind they're i mean they're they're in really bad shape right now. <laughs> so, it's going to be months before they actually get around to any of this. So, you want to make sure that you have all your documentation and all your records um to support that you attempted to stop this and that you attempted to return the funds in case there's an issue later on. I would I just thought about this. Um actually it's it's not considered a public charge. Uh like the recent memo just came out, you know, these food stamps and social security benefits And all of that is considered public charge. Unemployment insurance is not considered public charge. However, if you are able or unable to receive it, is the difference we are discussing here. And me and Jenny's report, we are suggesting that you uh, that you are not eligible. So documentation would be the key, as it is in every immigration situation, right? You have to go through so much um, process at this point. So, documentation would be the key if you did that point that you did, did you try to return it back or did you you know did you try and that to return back oh okay thank you yes uh i think with mindful of time uh like we, we have this contact information shared by Jennifer on the screen So if you have any more queries or concerns you can just write an email to them or you can also ask me I can probably ask them and get back to you <clears throat> and thank you so much Ruby thank you so much Jennifer for giving your time to share all this detailed information and I am very sure that every piece of information you have shared is very helpful to all our students so thank you for being so generous thank you for joining in today Oh, thank and you guys, for having us. And guys, the session is also recorded, and it will be on the YouTube channel of the Bharatiyam. So I'll also share that thing, so you can see it again and clarify whatever doubts you have in this. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, everyone who participated here. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for having us. Yes. Thank you, Jennifer. It's it was really good to know about you again. Yes. <laughs> thank. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Thank you.